Well, it's right about noon, nine o'clock on the West Coast. And so I'll call this meeting to order. <laughs> um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to welcome you to the opening webinar of the Future of Workplace Dispute Resolution series. I'm Sandra Smith Gangle, Diversity and Inclusion Practice Chair of Lehrer's Dispute Resolution section. I'm pleased to be the convener of the first webinar in the series, The Future Diversity in, and Inclusion in Employment Dispute Resolution. I understand that about 500 labor relations professionals, professors, students, and others have registered for our series and this webinar. We thank you and we thank the many organizations, the ABA, the American Arbitration Association, the National Academy of Arbitrators, the Association for Conflict Resolution, and several universities who are co-sponsoring the series. At this point, I'd like to share the screen. And that, that is the lead screen for the name of our series. The series is dedicated to Professor David Okay, the series has been dedicated to Professor David Lipsky, a retired professor from Cornell University and past president of Lyra. And I understand he was mentor to hundreds of upcoming arbitrators and mediators, and that, that's a wonderful tribute. The, the series is also honoring the memory of arbitrator Marcia Greenbaum, who recently passed away Marcia was past president and pioneer award winner for the Society of Professionals in Dispute Resolution. And she earned a lifetime achievement award from Lyra. And she also was a mentor and leader for many upcoming professionals in dispute resolution. And she developed programs, dispute resolution programs, even in other countries. We chose a quotation of the US Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor from her 2003 decision in Greta v. Bollinger to start us off. First, Justice O'Connor cited the statement from Justice Lewis Powell in Bakke versus University of California 25 years earlier, back in 1978, where he said that the constitution, quote, does not prohibit a narrowly tailored use of race to further a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. Then Justice O'Connor held that University of Michigan's consideration of race as a factor in law school admissions had been proper because it was not a quota system just a type of affirmative action. And then Justice O'Connor added the following comment. Are we there yet? So we are asking you the question, are we there yet in 2021, 18 years after the Grutter case and 43 years after the Bakke case? Our panel believes that more work needs to be done they will share their views on the current status of diversity and inclusion in workplace dispute resolution and will propose specific steps that should be taken in order to improve the numbers sufficiently so that Justice O'Connor's expectation can be met at least within the next decade. Hopefully by 2030, racial and gender discrimination will no longer exist in labor and employment dispute resolution. I'm Sandra Smith Gangle, the convener of this session. I was initially discouraged from becoming a lawyer and fighting for employment justice because I was a woman. So I became a French teacher for 12 years. Then after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 began to be implemented in the legal profession, I was finally able to enter Willamette University College of Law 
I was 34 years old. I was fortunate to become a law clerk of Professor Carlton J. Snow. Many of you remember Professor Snow as a distinguished labor arbitrator. My clerkship became a mentorship and ultimately I became a labor arbitrator myself. I was the first woman from Oregon to be approved on the AAA and FMCS panels. My book, Madam Arbitrator, tells the story of my career. So now we're going to move to our panelists. I'll tell you about them. There are three very distinguished labor and employment arbitrators. Justice Myra Selby received her JD degree from the University of Michigan School of Law, then served as director of health care policy for the state of Indiana. She was the first woman and the first African American to sit as an associate justice on the Indiana Supreme Court. Justice Selby helped make several landmark decisions regarding taxes, insurance, and tort reform, and she chaired the Indiana Supreme Court Commission on Race and Gender Fairness. Justice Selby is now a partner at the Ice Miller Law Firm in Indianapolis and is a columnist for the Indianapolis Business Journal. Professor Homer LaRue is a professor of law at Howard University and founder and co-director of the university's School of Law ADR, ADR program. He is a labor and employment lawyer with over 35 years of experience and is a vice president of the National Academy of Arbitrators. Professor LaRue was awarded the distinguished De La Berthe Raven Award in 2020 by the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution. The award honors Professor LaRue's long and outstanding service to the ADR community and is the highest individual award given by the ABA Dispute Resolution Section. Arbitrator Alan Simonet has been a full-time labor and employment arbitrator since 1988. He is the president and owner of Simonet ADR Services, Inc. in Media, Pennsylvania. Arbitrator Simonet is a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators and currently serves as president of its Research and Education Foundation. He is a fellow and current president of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. He's also active in the ABA Labor and Employment Section as council representative, and he serves on the advisory board of the Scheinman Institute at Cornell University School of Industrial Relations. <clears throat> Now, our, our panel is going to uh, work together as a, uh, a group, as a discussion group, where they're not going to break and just speak one at a time separately. Uh, so I'm going to give the audience kind of an overview first of the topics that they are going to each discuss uh, and focus upon, but they themselves will move the program along. Professor or, uh, Arbitrator Simonet will be the lead discussant on the issue of the evolving ADR environment. He will talk about the foundation of ADR as an institution, the recognition of the authority of an arbitrator, and the importance of trust in the institution of dispute resolution. And he will also discuss the changing and increasing demand for ADR services that's happening today. Justice Selby is the lead discussant on the issues of obstacles to, create, to increasing diversity and inclusion of arbitrators and mediators, especially women and persons of color. She will talk about selection bias, what that means, risk aversion, the fact that the advocates seem to prefer familiar names and they pass over names of persons that they don't know very well. And she will talk about the challenges in building a successful career. 
So those are our three. Oh, no, Homer. <laughs> Homer, uh, pro Professor and, and uh, Arbitrator LaRue will be the lead discussant on a topic that he calls the times they are a changing. He's going to tell you that int intentional strategies for building a new cadre of arbitrators is possible and how what those strategies are. He will give as examples the Salon uh, programs of the uh, National Academy of Arbitrators and how mentorship is important to all new and upcoming arbitrators. And then he will give an overview of a very important program that he and arbitrator Simonette have worked on called the Ray Corollary Initiative. So before I turn it over to our speakers, uh, our panel uh, has requested a um, poll and uh, the Lyra team will now post the poll that uh, we have designed. And we'd like the audience to just take a few seconds to uh, read that and fill in. Yes, I, I got mine on my screen, so everybody should have, I hope. Um, if you just click on, you first read each of the questions and click on your, your choices of, of answers. And we'll leave that up as the speakers begin. Uh, actually, I think we'll just, we'll just give a minute because the, our speakers would like me to give you what the answers are before they begin. So let's just take a moment. Well, Lyra team, do we have some results to post? Ah, excellent. Okay, well, I'm gonna take, let, the, let the audience take a look at that. And um, it looks like 51% agree that implicit but an, or unconscious bias adversely affects the second the selection of persons of color as dispute resolvers in labor and employment disputes, and two percent strongly disagree. So, in between the uh, there's a kind of a staggering number of people on each of the choices. With regard to implicit or unconscious bias. Re, uh, in the selection of women as conflict resolvers, it's much closer to 50-50. Only 46% strongly agree that that remains a problem. But 38% are, are aware that, that it still is. So I think that probably our speakers will uh, further discuss uh, that, that issue in their, in their remarks. Uh, okay, now I will try to get back to. <clears throat> I guess as Sandra moves into the next slide, um, um, I guess I can begin uh, first by giving some comments uh, on the poll. Um, um, my initial reaction is I'm not surprised. We have um, uh, we have given this poll in prior. Um, uh, prior presentations, and pretty much the margins have remained the same. There are a couple of uh, interesting um, uh, things to note in that poll is that there is a little bit of a difference between whether they whether we're talking about implicit bias with respect to people of color and the implicit bias with respect to women. Um, I am not going to um, um, talk about that right now because we have to get into our presentation, but I think if our panel members have a thought about that, maybe when they make their presentations, uh, you can uh, uh, present your comment, and maybe there'll be time for discussion. So my role here is to talk about the a evolving ADR environment. Now, before we begin to talk about the future of workplace dispute resolution, Let's talk about where we are now. And there is always going to be a constant that we have um, that will remain constant now and 10 years from now. 
And that's what I'm going to start to talk about right now. And it, it is that before we talk about the future of ADR, we must acknowledge that constants. And that is the basic foundation of the presence. Um, in order for ADR to be effective, the parties must trust the process. That means that the parties or the users must have faith in the skills of the neutral and must also respect his or her authority to make decisions and make rulings um, in the process. Uh, as a way of explaining what this means in a practical sense, um, our panel uh, decided that we would provide a couple of real life examples of the importance of this underlying principle. Uh, now, uh, Justice Selby and I shared a couple of stories about our own personal experiences in mediation and myself in arbitration. Uh, so, uh, uh, Justice Selby, you plan, would you mind kind of giving us what your experience was? And you have to unmute. There we go. Uh, sure, Alan. And um, let me just say, um, to be the um, uh, the road between uh, Mr. Uh, LaRue and Mr. Simonet uh, today is quite an honor for me. Uh, these gentlemen pair up often. Um, and so I hope that I will not be the interloper, but rather the, the flower uh, today. Um, my experience that, that uh, I think illustrates the importance of of trust and, and faith in achieving a fair outcome is, is rather unique in that it happened to me while I was not in the role of neutral. I wasn't the arbitrator or mediator in this case, I was the advocate. I was representing a client, um, a large public university in a, an employment dispute with um, a head coach, one of their head coaches. The coach was African-American um, and after a day-long mediation where we were in an entrenched um, uh, lock impasse, um, there were hours that went by. I was in the room with my client. The mediator came into our room and asked me if I would consider going into the other room to meet with the coach. He had requested to talk to me. After sort of explaining that I'm the lawyer for the other side, this was unusual and, and in fact, um, baffling. Um, we got the necessary permissions and waivers, and I did go into the room and, and talk with the coach for a couple of hours. The long story short of it was that he pointed to me among all of the people in that mediation as someone that he had to trust someone who was relaying the, the exact same position to him that my client had been at for hours. But hearing it from me and then asking me his question um, gave him that sense of trust and faith in the process that he needed in order for us to resolve the dispute. And we did, in fact, settle it. Um, so it was a shocking uh, turn. Uh, for me as a lawyer in that role, and yet it was a resounding confirmation of the importance of what Alan's going to talk about. Yeah, thank you, Justice Selby. Um, uh, you may be the, the flower, but I do just add a little bit of class for, to, to the, the crew of, of Homer and me. <laughs> so thank you so much. But um, my, my story, and I know some people who are participating in this seminar may have heard it before, but it's probably um, some, a, a story and an incident that happened to me that helped kind of define my practice going forward. Um, uh, at the beginning of my career, which began as an arbitrator in uh, 1988, uh, I was conducting a hearing at the American Arbitration Association um, in Philadelphia. And um, the, the, the late arbitrator, Walter Gershenfeld, walks in with a young uh, black man uh, who, he as he explained to me, uh, was from South Africa. Um, the, uh, he was involved with uh, 
what at the time, and this is before the release of Nelson Mandela and the uh, and his election, uh, was something called the Sullivan Principles, and that was a uh, um, a program by the late Reverend Leon Sullivan to get companies in South Africa to engage and to hire and train uh, Black people in that country in management roles. Um, this young man was in the management training program, and he had the opportunity to come to the United States to observe um, uh, American labor relations uh, and collective bargaining arbitration. Uh, uh, arbitrator Gershenfeld's um, uh, uh, hearing had settled, so he brought him into my room. And so I did the hearing like I always do, um, made my rulings, um, conducted the hearing. Uh, it ended a little bit after lunchtime. And uh, I decided to take the young man out to lunch. And we sat and as I was preparing to explain the similarities and differences between labor relations in South Africa and the United States, he stopped me and he said, wait, wait. And I said, well, what's up? He says, well, I, how do you do that? And I asked him, uh, how do I do what? He says, you're the only black man in the room with all of these white individuals, you're telling them when to talk, when to be quiet, when to sit down, when to stand up. How do you do that? Now, admittedly, I thought, took that pretty much for granted. Hell, I'm the arbitrator. I can tell them what to do when I want to do it. But for him, that showed the impression, that gave him the impression of how important that role was. And so, it goes back to the initial point before Justice Selby's story, and that is the foundation, the basis of this institution depends on whether there is trust in the dispute resolver and the authority of the dispute resolver is recognized. So that's now, and that will be 10 years from now. So what happens when we talk about the future? Uh, first, many of us feel that the AD, that ADR will continue to be in greater demand. Uh, more and more people are recognizing the benefits of ADR. There are many beneficial reasons into entering in dispute, into dispute resolution. We know uh, what they are. The overall cost, court costs will continue to climb. And the time taken to resolve disputes in the court system will continue to increase. And in addition, as someone who has spent their entire career in labor relations, the role of ADR will continue to be the best way to resolve workplace disputes while preserving the ongoing relationships between unions and employers. My last point here is that everyone indeed recognizes the importance and the increased diversity in the workplace. Our workplaces will continue to be diverse. And therefore, we must have individuals resolving dispute, uh, the workplace disputes that represent that diversity. So we have, we need to have professionals who basically look like the work people, work people in the workplace. Yet the future of the profession, therefore, is going to be de depending on how we deal with the qualification and selection of these um, professionals. So I'm going to turn this back over to Justice Selby to talk about some of the reasons ADR professionals are selected and some of the hurdles with respect to qualifying for uh, to become an ADR professional. Justice Selby. Thanks, Alan. Um, just to uh, sharpen, further sharpen the point that um, uh, Alan has just made with respect to um, what the workplace ought to look like and how that should be reflected in uh, the dispute resolvers, I would um, offer this quote from Gwen Wil Wilcox of uh, Levy Ratner Law Firm in New York City. She notes, 
I believe that increasing the diversity among arbitrators is extremely important to the process. While the diversity of the workforce has drastically changed over the years, it is evident that the arbitrator pool has not evolved to the same extent. The majority of arbitrators do not reflect the workers who appear before them and cannot identify with their realities as workers. Diversity among arbitrators will provide more credibility to the process in the eyes of the grievance. Also, a more diverse panel of arbitrators will provide a wider range of perspectives and experiences that are often lacking among arbitrators who have had life experiences that differ greatly from those of the grievance. So I think that quote really fairly sums up the, 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 the why um, and, and the benefit of diversity. Um, the, the different voice can't be heard if the different voice is never there. Um, so what are some of the obstacles to, to achieving uh, greater diversity among arbitrators and mediators? Well, there are um, several uh, that are um, uh, substantial and, and recognized. One is selection bias. Um, selection bias operates when, when users or those who are selecting the neutral um, select towards who they know or select towards um, the manner um, of selection that they've always followed, whether that's circulating um, a question around to other uh, lawyers that they know, saying, hey, who knows somebody that I can use? Or they just uh, always resort to their list of arbitrators that they're familiar with or have used in the past. So selection bias is something that, and of course, selection bias operates in many different uh, perspectives um, and, and in many different uh, settings. But it definitely operates to um, uh, depress diversity in um, in arbitrator selection. Another um, uh, uh, wind that moves and blows against achieving diversity is that Many times advocates are just risk averse. They don't really want to take the leap of using someone that they haven't used before or with whom they are not familiar uh, because they feel like, uh, whether it's true or not, they feel like it, it is a risk. They feel like that, that risks um, uh, the outcome that they want to achieve or it risks having a smooth um, mediation and or arbitration. And then finally, there are challenges in building a successful career in dispute resolution. And so that continues to be a, um, a challenge. I wouldn't call it an obstacle because it's something that um, many, many, many of us have, um, have uh, overcome or, or addressed. Um, but there are challenges in building a successful career, um, and they come from the fact that um, to build a successful career in dispute resolution, you have to pull from several different aspects of, of your um, um, capabilities and qualifications. First, you have to be um, uh, focused in an area about which you have substantive capabilities. Um, and in labor and employment, there are um, many, many, many uh, neutrals who um, believe that they, they can jump in and um, some are better than others. And, and typically um, it goes back to that substantive area uh, preparation. Also to get into dispute resolution, there's a connection and networking um, that is a very strong support uh, that happens and needs to happen. And so for people getting into the field, um, that networking and taking the initiative to meet people and, and build on those experiences is very important. Again, I wouldn't call that an obstacle. I would call it, though, a challenge. And I think Homer's going to talk a little bit more about how to meet some of those um, challenges 
Homer, Homer you have to unmute. It. You're muted. Thank you. My apologies. As long as I've been doing this, you would think I would always know this, but <laughs> it happens. All right, the times they are changing. Notwithstanding what uh, my colleagues have said, there are changes, and I think those changes will affect what this look, what our field looks like in 2030. But only, and I stress this, only if we take action now. If we continue to dither, we will not make Justice O'Connor's 2028 deadline. So what are some of the things that we wanted, want to talk about that we need to concentrate on. And one of those is intentional strategies for building a new cadre of arbitrators going from what uh, Alan has said. Alan and I have authored a, a law review article in which we talk about two aspects of our, of our profession, what we call the upfront problem and the back, the back end problem. The front end problem is how to bring more people in, and certainly persons of color and women, into the areas of mediation and arbitration as arbitrators, as mediators. And one of those that I think is, is quite novel and answers the problem of supply, and I want to laud her efforts, Dr. Catherine Simpson has developed something called the LIST. The full name is the list colon arbitrators of African descent. Now it is a list of about 250 people. I may have the number because it continues to grow who have experience either as advocates in international commercial disputes or have experience as neutrals. All of them may not have the same degree of experience in international disputes, but all of them have a good deal of experience as ADR advocates or neutrals. The idea is to answer that old SOP, well, there just aren't any, and usually it's just aren't any qualified, which is a term I don't use any longer when I talk about diversity. So that's one, one thing I think that will add to our moving the needle forward. Secondly, uh, mentorships have been around for a long time. Uh, and I, I'm gonna talk about that briefly, but we know what they are. We have to emphasize in our membership organizations, the importance of those of us who are in the field to reach out and take on persons as apprentices. We have to do that in order to be able to bring new people in, both persons of color, women, and simply new arbitrators. Uh, both Alan and I have heard many, many times, we need newer arbitrators. We need, where are, where's the profession going to be when we get to the point where the ones that we have are gone? One interesting membership organization has taken on something, has developed something called salons. I won't pronounce it as Sandra did, who is an expert in French and pronounces it in the French, with the French tones. Uh, mine's just a simply old Midwest <laughs> connotation. Well, what is the salon though? Uh, I and four colleagues have developed um, a place where not brand new arbitrators, but newer arbitrators, arbitrators who are not quite ready to apply for membership in the National Academy of Arbitrators, but, are, but have a thriving practice. We've created a safe space for those persons to have an intimate discussion about what we do. The nature of what we do does not allow us to have that conversation with advocates. And so we are very careful to keep our thoughts to ourselves. And yet we all know that feedback from our colleagues is one of the important ways in which we become lifelong learners and continue to grow. The salon that we have started, uh, 
we are in our second, we have our second cohort now. That means we've been operating for two years. Uh, it's in the DC mid Atlantic region, but I'm happy to say that other regions of the National Academy have also begun salons so that we have four of them around the country now. And I think they are growing. The idea of being able to assist newer arbitrators and giving them a safe place to have the kinds of conversations that I'm talking about is very important. Now, the final one I want to, final uh, times are changing that I want to talk about is what Alan and I have termed the Ray Corollary Initiative or the RCI. The RCI is devoted to increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And it's focused on the back end of what I said is the problem. That is the selection problem that Myra spoke to. That the tendency, and I wrote about this in 1992, I believe, uh, the tendency of advocates because of aversion, risk aversion, to select persons who look like them. And of course, that tends to be white, male and senior. So it's, un it's not surprising that the persons who are selected as mediators and arbitrators hasn't changed very much. I have posited it that that is a area of unconscious or implicit bias. And the question is, how do we tackle that? And it's been, the Ray Corollary Initiative builds on empirical research in social science, builds on two other programs that have been around for a while, the Rooney Rule and the Mansfield Rule. The empirical evidence shows that when the final pool for selection contains 30% persons of color and women, the chances of that per, of a person, of the party selecting a person of color goes up exponentially. And we explain that much more, much in much more detail in our article. So what does that mean? That means that that metric needs to be part of the plan for increasing diversity. It is not sufficient for us to simply say, we aspire to have an increase in diversity. We must have a way and a method and data collection that demonstrates how we do that. Now, the Ray Corollary Initiative is built on, as I said before, the RC, the, the Rooney Rule and the Mansfield Rule. For those of you who are not football fans, you may not know about the Rooney Rule. Just let me explain it very briefly. Uh, in 2003, the teams in the, AF, in the NFL agreed that because of the dearth of black coaches and upper management in those teams, something needed to be done. And so they agreed that every time from 2003 on, every time that there was an opening for a coach or a front office position, a black person, and now a woman as well, had to be interviewed. No commitment that they would be hired, but they had to be interviewed. And the research shows that there was a marked increase in the number of black coaches. In fact, one of the Super Bowls was historic in that the two teams in the Super Bowl were both coached by black coaches. Now there's a lot of criticism that can be laid at the, at the feet of the uh, Rooney rule, but it's a start. And it means that having a metric again is an important part of what we need to be doing. The second rule, if you will, upon which the corollary is based is called the Mansfield, Pro Mansfield rule. This is aimed at big firms. Initially in Mansfield one, there were approximately 70 to 100 firms that agreed that in every situation in which they were hiring for partner or for upper division uh, leadership in their firms, that the final selection pool 
would contain 30% diverse people. And that has now morphed into a very successful diversity program in Mansfield 4.0. I think something like 300 firms have come to participate in that, in that experiment. And it, the importance of the 30% metric has been noted by all of the firms and particularly the firm that won the 2019 uh, Mansfield Award indicated that the 30% is what motivated the leadership of the firm to truly go into seriously uh, applying this. So the RCI or the uh, Ray Corollary Initiative seeks to apply what we've learned in those two experiments to the ADR community. And what it says is that advocates as well as rostering agencies need to begin to, to, so, to put together their correction, their selection uh, lists with this 30% metric. So what does that mean? That means that every list that goes out must be 30% diverse. What does it mean if the parties as they do in collective bargaining are selecting a roster of arbitrators or mediators? That means that each advocate comes to the table with a list that is 30% diverse, thus increasing markedly the, the probability that the final selection of the list will be 30% diverse. But it's not enough to simply have an aspiration. What the Ray Corollary Initiative does is calls for a national task force of the ADR community to implement this project in much the same way as the diversity labs has implemented the Mans Mansfield rule. So that means calling for monitoring one another, collecting data about the choices and how the choices are made and sharing that data. So that what happens in the next couple of years is a marked increase in the culture as to how we select arbitrators and mediators. Thank you. We'll take questions, I think, very shortly. You two Andrew, are- you're you're muted. Muted. You're muted. Andrew, you on mute. Yes, on behalf of the group of uh, attendees, I want to thank our speakers for uh, giving us some uh, excellent uh, ideas for the future and uh, reasons, rationale for the uh, issues that we addressed at the very beginning, namely, uh, uh, the difficulty of uh, persons of color and women uh, of, ach of achieving acceptability in the arbitration profession. Uh, so let's hope that the uh, numbers, they become more consistent with the demographics of the workplace over the next few years and that we do reach the goal that uh, Justice O'Connor cited in her decision uh, by uh, 2030. Uh, in looking at the chat, I see that there are a couple of uh, attendees who have uh, made several comments. So I think we might be appropriate to have uh, ask them to, um, to begin the discussion. One is someone named Jeanette, and I don't have her last name. And the other is um, Charles uh, Crumpton. So why don't we begin with Jeanette, and then we will uh, hear from, from, uh, from Charles Crumpton uh, with your questions. Jeanette? Oh, I had just put in the chat to you that um, there are not a lot of arbitrators that are women and people of color. And, you know, the question, you know, is there a bias? I am sure there's a bias. There's a, listen, you know, we all have to admit there's discrimination in the world. Um, but, you know, there are not a lot to choose from. Now, I represent in the city of Detroit. And I specifically, when we're looking, going for a panel, I specifically look first, we would look at the win-loss ratio, right? So that's what we want. But when I'm looking at a panel, a lot of the people I represent are female and black and brown. So I want arbitrators on the list that look like the people that we represent. 
I mean, there are Caucasian people there, but the majority are uh, that I represent in these units are women and people of color. So I specifically, I mean, I, I have used female arbitrators and I'm trying to think if there's been a male African-American arbitrator at the table when I, when I did arbitrations and I can't recall one, okay? But I specifically called the office and said, can you give me uh, an African-American female to put on the list Okay, and one that has a good, I'm sorry, win-loss with the union, right? We don't want somebody that's just all uh, for the employer. And fortunately, you know, there was one that I was looking at. I didn't know I had the name and I didn't know whether she, what her race was. And we were able to put her on the list, but you're right. Um, and the majority of arbitrators that I deal with, I mean, are older. So you do need to look at replacing them. Is, is your question directed to any particular panelist? No, it's not a question. It's just a statement. And um, I appreciate that you're doing this. Um, you know, but here, here is one issue. Um, I mean, I know a woman who's a mediator that probably shortly will be looking to be an arbitrator. Um, it is difficult because you do have to get people to choose you, right? So, you know, I appreciate you're doing this, but how are you going to actively promote them? I mean, I hear some of it, but is there specific ways? And is there ways that we can help when you do it? Like send are, out a list to us. There are. One of the things that, excuse me, one of the things that we're doing in the academy, for example, with the salon, and again, uh, I acknowledge that that's a, that's a somewhat of a small slice because we're looking at people who are not altogether new, but who have a practice. What we've been able to do with the salon is get the people who are participating in the salon in labor management conferences where they're making presentations on panels. And so the parties are able to sometimes even ask them questions about the way they think about cases. That's one way of doing it. And increasing in that kind of activity by membership organizations, I think is, is, is key. Uh, as you heard me say in my remarks, I think that the, the, the real problem is the, not the real problem, but the problem that has not been focused on enough is the back end, the selection, how and, and dealing with selection bias. And so I've been emphasizing that part of it, but I don't, I certainly don't deny that we should not do more to increase the supply of persons of color and women. If, if I can possibly add another point is, is that um, in the, with the parties that I have spoken to uh, with respect to the selection of arbitrators going back and, and mostly I'm talking, speaking to labor management people, the attorneys especially will say, I want, want a panel with people I know to I don't want to look good, look bad before my client. Um, those are the two top criteria. Now, some of us have argued, um, and I know it's over the years, is to tell parties, and this is in the labor relations context, is, look, you have a short suspension, a low risk case, or do you have a warning letter or something that does not uh, blow up the contract. That's the way I say it. Why don't you use arbitrators who are new, who are of color, and see how just see how they work out for you? There's a low risk case. Why can't you just do that? And um, and so and at the same time, I wanted to add that because those of us who are busy, if you want to wait nine months to get uh, before a particular arbitrator you want, you're just wasting your time and money and working against uh, your best interest with respect to the process. Okay, thank you very can much. I one, can I make one more comment on that? All right. Now, I do know that um, it doesn't seem to be the same kind of situation when you go to mediation. When you're using a, like FMCS or in Michigan Merck, it seems to be that the selection is more diverse. And I don't know if, if you have noticed that, and that's all. That's all. 
Oh, but in, in the FMCS, if you're picking an arbitrator, that's one thing. If you're picking a, a mediator, now mind you, FMCS will assign cases to to their to their commissioners or their mediators, which tend to result in um, those mediators being more diverse because they are employed by the FMCS. Okay. Thank you for, for those answers. Uh, the other person who has submitted some questions is uh, Charles Crumpton. And I would like to just uh, summarize one of his comments uh, that he, he said that I missed one of the important points about arbitrator uh, and uh, Justice Myra Selby when I gave my introduction. Uh, he said that her nomination to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals by President Obama was blocked Otherwise, she would be on the Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and that uh, she is reportedly among the prospective federal court nominees of President Biden. And uh, he believes that she would be a deserving successor to RBG's, R Rose Bur uh, Bader Ginsburg's uh, legacy and heritage on the Supreme Court. And I think we all clearly agree, to agree upon that. So with that, I'll pass it to uh, the, for, uh, Mr. Crumpton for his, his uh, question. Yeah, first, I wanted to, for all of us, thank Sandra, Homer, Myra, and Alan, heroes for all of us for a very long time and into the future. Um, Inclusion on rosters doesn't move the needle. Homer's exactly right. So what I do personally is if I'm a party appointed arbitrator, I immediately contact the other party appointed arbitrator and I'm gonna push as hard as I can to get a diverse third arbitrator appointed. So far, pretty good degree of success in that. When I'm appointed mediator, I will push as hard as I can to get agreement to a diverse co-mediator if I get pushback. And, and I'll offer blended fees so they're not paying more or much more for it because that's the usual objection. If they still push back, then I get agreement in many cases to bring on a shadow mediator like a mentee, but they're not. As far as I'm concerned, they're co-equal. I don't do mentoring, I do companioning. So I throw that out there to folks, encourage you. We can make a difference, let's do it. May I comment on that? Thank you very much, Charles, for that comment. Uh, the other thing that I've been thinking about and haven't had a chance to say to Lyra, uh, where you have a number of academics, that there are a lot of, uh, I think, false beliefs about selection of a, of a of an unknown person and what will happen. And I think this is, a, this is a fruitful place for research. Does it really, if you don't know the person, is the outcome really adverse or something you didn't expect? And I think that we need a lot more research about the arguments that advocates put forward with regard to the risks. And maybe we can, begin with data to dispel some of those myths. Sandra, I'd like to ask a question of Homer, if I might. Um, uh, with respect to your uh, salons, how do you um, how do you select the, the individuals who participate? I must say that it, it is an informal selection process. Uh, we really go by uh, who we know, there are four of us who are conveners. We look at the DC area, we look at the Philadelphia area, and we ask who's out there, who do we know, um, who seems to have a practice and the practice seems to be growing. We don't have a geographic uh, limitation, and particularly now in the last, this year, all of our meetings have been <laughs> virtual. Uh, and so, there is no formal selection process or invitation process. It really is trying to figure out who's there and who might want to participate. 
And if I can add one other point is, is that, um, um, and, and it's kind of unfortunate, be, us, and hopefully we'll be out of this virtual world and be in person at some point, but we get around to Lyra meetings, you get around to, um, uh, uh, and I'm active in the ABA, and they have a very large labor and employment section, CLE. And um, I see some, some faces that show up on a regular basis. I think if you see someone who is interested, who is studying, I have either approached them or they have approached me and I've gotten their name and their card and referred them to uh, people like Homer um, and um, they have been invited. I know some of those faces are on this, um, uh, on this call um, and I, I recognize some of them. Um, a lot of the people that I have uh, uh, worked with or encouraged um, have basically approached me um, and asked, well, what do I need to do? They've reached a point in their career where they're, they've developed the interest in collective, especially from my, my uh, position in collective bargaining, and they want to be involved in arbitration. And if you see people with the desire to be engaged in that um, and make themselves known uh, then um, basically my feeling is I encourage them to move forward uh, and continue to make their decision uh, as to whether how far they want to go in the profession. Uh, and uh, Homer and other members of the salon, uh, Margie Brogan, my good friend uh, from here in Philadelphia, um, they get the names from me. Thank you. Thanks. I, I would add one comment to what Homer said about what um, the roster keepers can do. I think that the roster keepers, when they send out a list to parties, um, should include more information, especially about the new people who the uh, recipients might not be familiar with. What is their resume? What, what have they written? What are some of their writings? Um, what references have, have been submitted in conjunction with their application. If, the, if just a name and, is, and a residence address is given, then the uh, advocates really have very little to go on in making their decision. I see that it's almost 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock here in the, Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest, but one o'clock for you folks. And uh, I'm supposed to firmly end this at one o'clock. So do we have time for one more question? Is there, is there one other person who would like to ask a question? Let's see, I see there have been some new messages. Several people have said, thank you. Uh, someone asked, are mediators actually included on the arbitrator lists? They are. They are not, well, let me explain it this way. FMCS has an arbitration roster. Uh, AAA has both an arbitration and a mediation roster. Uh, arbitration deals primarily with labor. Their mediation roster is employment. They generally, many of the people on any of these lists are, do both, both kinds of work. They both, as the three of us do, we arbitrate and we mediate. And Janet Gilman from the Oregon Employment Relations Board suggested that Lyra chapters play an important role in fostering the connections between advocates. I think that point has been made uh, also by you folks. Um, and uh, the, she suggests a meet and greet and, at, and conference opportunities that would feature uh, the new people as speakers and not just the good old per people that are that are already familiar to the uh, uh, pr participants. Uh, uh, one one point that I wanted to see, I saw Shauna Meacham had, had asked that do we re recommend any specific languages in the collective bargaining agreements to ensure more diverse panels in arbitration. Um, as arbitrators, we're seldom in that position to make that recommendation. Uh, and even mediators kind of step over the line if such, if they openly make that, they're not supposed to be recommending specific language. And that's one reason why we talk about the Ray Corollary is because if a party is committed to 
um, those kind of principles, then it will show up in the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, I see one final comment from Lisa Umscheidt, who's a member of the uh, Employment Relations Board of Oregon. And she says that local Lira chapters advancing this work, in addition to race and gender, need to consider other diversity and inclusion factors, uh, including advancing the careers and selection prospects of neutrals who are LGBT and who have disabilities. So that may be a topic for another webinar. Uh, yeah. Both uh, of those categories are included agreed. in the objective of the, uh, of the RCI. And they are also included in the Mansfield rule. Um, okay. Um, I think that we do have to end this because um, that's the, the way that the program was structured. But if there are other questions, uh, then we, by all means, uh, continue audience to add them to the, the chat and the uh, staff will assemble those and then we'll send them out uh, as appropriate to, uh, to the participants. So I thank you all for participating. I especially thank the, the, the panelists who were so informative and we wish you all a good day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.